Welcome to Wannabe Clutter Free, formerly Wannabe Minimalist, the podcast for busy families who are tired of the chaos, fed up with being overwhelmed, and ready to enjoy life again. Each week, we talk about how to let go of the clutter so that you can focus on the things that actually matter. And it's not just physical clutter. We talk about the mental and emotional stuff too, because if it's holding you back, it's time to ditch it. I share what I've done in my own life to declutter, organize, and calm the chaos, but you won't just hear it from me. There are amazing guests too. It's practical, doable, and simple for those of us that want to be clutter-free. Well, hey there, my friend. Welcome back to the show. My name is Deanna Yates, and you are listening to episode 194 of the Wanna Be Clutter-Free podcast. On today's episode, I am talking about decluttering as an act of self-love. It is the last couple days of February as this episode comes out, and February is all about Valentine's Day here in the U.S., where we show our love to our friends, families, and our loved ones, and I think we need to make sure that we are also showing that love to ourselves. And one of the things that really surprised me when I started on my decluttering journey was that letting go of my stuff actually gave me such a reflection into my own life, into my own personality, into my own brain, and how I work. Also, it really helped me deal with some of the tough questions that I had in my life of why am I holding on to some of these things? Why do some things feel more important to me than others? And just letting myself sit with some of these emotions, whether they were good emotions, bad emotions, how I felt you know, it stirred up a lot. And so being able to go through that journey and make sure that I just showed myself self-love and compassion through all of that was really important. And it has really strengthened how I approach things. And I just want that for you as well, especially if you are feeling overwhelmed and things in your life feel chaotic, getting a handle on the stuff, the physical stuff in our lives really can help. And I know that it's not just about the stuff that surrounds you, though. There are other things that affect us. There's lots of other clutter. There's mental clutter. There's relationship clutter. And so I want to make sure that we talk about that a little bit today because you deserve to be living your best life, the life that works for you, the life that you are excited to wake up for every day. And I hope that I can help you a little bit with that today. But before we get too far into it, I do want to say thank you so much for joining me today. I know your time is busy and that you've got a lot going on if you're like me and you're a busy mom and maybe you're working from home or you're working outside of the home uh, or you're just working on raising your family right now. There is a lot that is pulling you in lots of different directions. So thank you so much for joining me today. And I will do my best to provide you information that is helpful, inspiring, encouraging, and helps you get to that next level that you want want to go to. And if you feel so inclined, I would absolutely love if you would share this episode with a friend or two. It's one of the ways that helps me grow my show and helps me make sure that I can keep spreading this message because I want to make sure that the world is filled with women fired up for living their best lives and doing the best that they can every day for themselves and their families. And so you can help me spread that message too. And if you don't want to share this with anybody, but you do like what you're hearing, you can always leave a review on Apple or Spotify. On Apple, you can leave up to a five-star review. On Spotify, you can leave me a rating there as well. You can also comment on those platforms. You can also see this episode. I'm trying this out. I'm going to try doing some solo episodes on YouTube as well. So you can see me over there too and comment and have a conversation there actually on YouTube, which we can't do on the podcast platforms just yet. Hopefully someday they'll allow us to communicate back and forth on there, but at the moment we cannot. So I will make sure that I leave links in the show notes. I'm going to talk about a couple different things today. I will leave links in the show notes and you can find those at wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 194. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and get into today's episode. Um, All right, so as we talk about self-care when it comes to decluttering, I want us to know that we generally, as busy moms, can let clutter accumulate while we neglect our own well-being, right? We're so busy worrying about other people. We're so busy about worrying about our children, worrying about our partners, worrying about our friends, worrying about the school, worrying about all the different things that are going on. 
And sometimes, just like when you are on an airplane and they tell you to put your oxygen mask on first, that's what this is about, right? We need to make sure that we get our own lives and our own stuff in order so that we can be that better version of ourselves, the version we want to show up as for our family every day. So it's not just about creating physical space, but it's about creating mental and emotional space too. So we're going to explore 10 tips for how busy moms like you and me can show ourselves some love through decluttering, letting go, and maybe embracing a little more minimalism in our life. So the first tip is to start small. This one is so important. I am guilty of not starting small. I'm guilty of trying to bite off way more than I can chew in so many different aspects of my life, whether that is trying a new business venture, whether it is decluttering an entire closet, maybe it is uh, trying to declutter my entire house in a whole weekend. Maybe I've done these things. I've done these things. (laughs) Um, Or I've tried to do these things, right? And you get overwhelmed because it's just too much. So I am guilty of trying to do too much at one time. So I will tell you from experience, it is much better to start a little bit smaller and really be able to tackle that one space and give it your full attention before you try to branch out and do something else. Starting small allows you to figure out what works for you. It allows you to ask a few really tough questions about why you're keeping things or why things are important to you, and then take that knowledge that you have and move on to another area with that in place, knowing what those answers were. And so then when you get to the next thing and you pick it up and you think, oh, this would have been really hard for me had I not already known that this isn't important to me. So I can go ahead and let this go. I don't have to spend the mental and emotional time getting over that piece of clutter because I've already dealt with that in the first spot. Or if you're trying to do it all at once, you're going to start to have these big things, these big stressors come up at you. And it's really hard to then make those decisions and be able to move past those things. So please, please, please start small. I talk about this a lot. Starting small is really the number one key to being able to not be overwhelmed when you are decluttering. So start with one small area. Maybe it's a shelf. Maybe it's a drawer. Maybe it is a category of things. So maybe you think, okay, I'm really struggling. I don't know what to do. My desk is a mess and I don't know where to start. Maybe you just start with a pencil cup. How can I declutter that? What is in there that I don't need, right? And just every day do a little bit more. And if you get through that first category and you're like, oh, I still have energy and I still have time, you can do a second category. That is so much more exciting than saying, I'm going to do my entire desk and getting disrupted in the middle of it, right? And not finishing. The feeling of not finishing is so defeating. Where is if I can say, I'm going to do my pencil cup. Oh my gosh, I did my pencil cup in 30 seconds. Okay, what else can I do? I'm going to do the pens. Okay, now I did the pens. Oh, someone needs my attention. But look, I accomplished two things, right? Versus I'm going to do my entire desk. Maybe you still got the pencils and pens done and then somebody needed your attention and you think, gosh, I didn't get that whole desk done. Man, what a failure I am. See how it's different? Same exact results, completely different approach and completely different feeling when you get interrupted or you have to pause or switch your focus and do something else, okay? So please, please, please start small. It really does help. And it prevents that overwhelm. It allows you to see progress quickly and it boosts your motivation to continue decluttering. You can always do more, but it is way harder to scale back. So please start small. All right, number two is to set realistic goals. Please understand, decluttering is a process. It is a journey. It really is a journey. And I still declutter. I have been decluttering for a decade I don't know, a long time. I've been decluttering for a very long time. I still declutter. I was just talking to my neighbor the other day about the Facebook Buy Nothing group, and I was like, you really absolutely should be on here. I'm on here all the time. I'm constantly giving things away. Sometimes I will get things from the group as well, but there are so many things. And she's like, what? To your house? I feel like I always go over to your house and there's nothing around. And I said, it's because I declutter all the time. I'm still decluttering, but it's not overwhelming because it's just become part of our routine, right? As soon as we see something that we are not using or we finished with it, 
it then gets to the point where we think, okay, well, that is to be donated, decluttered, given to someone else. Who else can use this thing? I love giving away things on our Buy Nothing group. And especially when you have children, they are constantly growing. They're constantly in new phases. It is a super easy way for you to then just clear it out, right? Unless you have other children coming up that are going to use those things and then please only keep the good things, like the things that they're actually going to use and they're actually going to want. Please do not burden your younger children with the discards from your older children just because they're there. Make sure they're things that they actually want because they are their own people too, please. So just so we keep that in mind, it's really easy if we think about it as a cycle or as a journey or something that is going to be with us for a while, it's a lot easier than you know thinking about it as an end goal, as a one-time thing, as something that we have to do. It is a one and done and it's this huge project, right? No, it's just part of our life, right? So maybe we're making a weekly trip to the donation center because right now that works for your life and you just need to get all of this stuff out at once and you don't have time to post it on the Buy Nothing group. Totally fine. Sometimes we have to do what works for us because there are going to be moments where there is a lot going on and we just have to be kind to ourselves. That's part of this self-love, right? Be gentle and kind and gracious with yourself. Know what you can do and do what you can do, but please don't feel guilty or burdened or pressured. It's okay. Then when you have more space and more bandwidth, maybe then you're starting to give back to your community a little bit more through a buy nothing group or something where you feel like more connected with how you're donating and discarding your things. So again, want to set realistic goals and realistic expectations. Decluttering is something we're just going to continue to do in our life. And that is okay. That is not meant to be overwhelming. It is not meant to be defeating. It's meant to be something where you just think like, okay, how can I work this in? Because as we continue to consume, unless you stop consuming, you stop buying, you stop bringing things into your house, there will always be new things to go out. You're either upgrading things and so you're letting go of the old ones or, you know, you outgrow things and you let go of the things you've outgrown, whether that's a, you know, physical thing or whether that's an emotional thing you've outgrown and you no longer want it in your life. So that is number two, set realistic goals. Actually, I'm going to separate this into two. I'm going to do 11 things. That's really more realistic expectations. That's number two. Number three, if we want to talk about this for realistic goals, that's how much we declutter in a day, right? Or a week. So again, where I said, maybe we're talking about just decluttering the pencil jar, right? So maybe we say, I have five minutes. Look, I've got five minutes a day. That's really all I mentally and physically can fit into this day. Maybe that's for a whole week. Then once you start to clear some of those things out, things start to have a little more breathing room, maybe you can increase it to seven minutes a day. And then maybe it's 10 minutes a day. And then 15 minutes a day. And that's probably about where I would have you stop, honestly, 15 minutes a day. Because more than that, like I want us to get into the habit of doing this more consistently than three hours once a quarter, right? That starts to feel really overwhelming. It's really easy to push off. But if we say, look, I'm going to do 10, 15 minutes a day, not as big a deal. And we can make a lot of progress. And if you finish before your 10 or 15 minutes, we'll talk about this later. We want us to then have a little bit of space where we can say like, oh, well, great. Now it's me time. It's me space. I can do whatever I want now because this is my 15 minutes that I have set aside for my decluttering and my, you know, self-love here. So what am I going to do now that I've finished the thing I wanted to do? I don't have anything else. I promise you will get to that point. If you continually do this, if you work on this consistently, you will get to the point where you're like, oh, I actually don't have anything to declutter today. Great. What else can I do? Okay. So Number one, start small. Number two, set realistic expectations. Number three, set realistic goals. And please, please, please do not try to declutter everything at once. It didn't all enter your house at one time. It's not all going to leave your house at one time. So again, set achievable goals for yourself. Maybe it's you're going to declutter one room a week, right? So maybe you look and you say, okay, this week I'm going to focus on the kitchen. So I have a whole week And every day I'm going to do a little bit and I'm going to declutter this kitchen. And then next week I'm going to focus on the living room. And the week after that, I'm going to focus on my bedroom. And the week after that, I'm going to focus on the bathroom, right? 
do these in whichever order works for you. Um, but you can do one week, one room, and that really at least focuses you in this one space. And by the end of the week, you're going to start to see a little bit more progress. And what you weren't able to let go of on day one, you can more easily let go of it on day seven. So there is definitely some growing when you do that kind of a declutter. All right. So that was number three, realistic goals. Number four is to practice gratitude. So before discarding, this goes back to kind of that KonMari method where she uh, talked about really giving thanks to your things as you let them go. This is probably one of my favorite points that she makes in that book is really just expressing gratitude. I think sometimes we can feel guilty for having these things that we're letting go of and we can say, oh, I wasted money. I've wasted time. I've moved this thing around. I haven't actually used it. And you just feel wasteful when you get rid of things, if you don't allow yourself a moment to say, thank you. Thank you for being in my life. Thank you for being there when I needed. Maybe you bought something and you now look back and you're like, oh my gosh, that was such a frivolous purchase. I cannot believe I bought that thing. What was I thinking, right? These are some of the thoughts that might come up in your head. Instead, flip it and say, you know what? Thank you for being there for me. This was an emotional purchase. I was in a really tough spot. And you know what? Buying this gave me a little bit of joy. I am so thankful that I was in a place where I was able to buy this thing and it put a smile on my face and maybe I don't need it. And maybe it was a little over the top, but I am happy that I was able to do that. And now I'm going to let it go to someone else. Maybe someone else can use this. Um, and enjoy it as I did. And at least they won't have to spend the money on it if you give it in your buy nothing group or something like that, right? And it'll just be something else that you can then let go of. And if we look at it from that perspective where we thank it, if you're watching this video, you just saw my face go from like, oh my gosh, pain to a huge smile, right? It is infectious when we think of it that way. Because again, you're letting go of that layer of just like ick and guilt. And you think, oh, how nice that I was able to do this, right? You have a moment of joy and just appreciation. That can make a big difference. It's a subtle mindset shift, but it really does help when you're letting go of things because it lets you kind of let go of that guilt a little bit too of like, it's okay that I didn't use it. You know what? I learned something along the way. Looking at it from a different perspective really can make a big shift. So please try to practice gratitude and thank your items as you let go of them. I know it'll feel a little weird at first, especially if you're not used to that kind of idea. And again, I don't think that my water bottle has feelings, right? But my water bottle gives me feelings. And so from that perspective, I'm basically talking to myself. Maybe you just think of it as like talking to your past self and thanking your past self for what you did or giving your past self grace and um, just acknowledging where you were when you bought it or something like that. So I don't actually believe that these materials have feelings. We're not getting into that, but it is more of just like a an internal um, acceptance and appreciation that will really help you kind of move forward. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk about creating an area just for yourself and why that's important for you as you declutter. I'm Margaret. And I'm Amy. And together we host the podcast, What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood. Margaret, I would say you're sort of a where are my keys kind of mom. Correct. Sometimes a where are my kids kind of mom. <laughs> Well, you're, Amy, more of a, we were supposed to leave 35 seconds ago, Mom. I mean, touche. In each episode of What Fresh Hell, we come at a topic from our usually completely opposite perspectives. I bring the research. And I bring kind of the gimlet eye. Like, is that research really going to work, people? And almost 10 million downloads later, we're still laughing. We also talk to experts in the parenting field, plus parents with stories we can all learn from. We make each other laugh, we challenge each other's assumptions, and we have what we think is the best parenting community on the internet. Check out What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, welcome back. So the next one here is to create a me space. So as I was talking in part number two, which is now setting realistic expectations, I talked about kind of what to do if you ended up having extra time. Well, as you declutter and you look throughout your home, 
think about if there's an area of your home that you can set up just for you or an area that really makes you feel cozy and comfortable and you really enjoy it. So for me, there's a room in our home. It's like our, it's right off of our kitchen and it's where our dining room is, but we have set up a couple, well, it's one couch now and we got a new table. So we got rid of our other couch and we're looking to get a chair there. It is one of my favorite places to sit in the morning when I'm having my cup of coffee before the family wakes up and I can look out the window and I can see the sunrise and it is just such a relaxing space. So for me, that is the place that can kind of be my me space. Now, it's not just me that uses that room, right? But at that moment in the morning when everyone else is asleep, it is my space. It's just for me. And it is where I get to be cozy and comfy. And so for me, I want to have like a blanket in that space. It might be a good place to have a book for, you know, reading in the morning. I know I'm going to have my cup of coffee there. Sometimes I'll have my journal there. And so it's just a nice little area for me to kind of hang out. Now, again, there are very few spaces. Our home is not very big. I don't have a full room dedicated to myself. Even this office that I'm recording this in is shared with my husband. So there is no real area. I guess my desk, I have a different desk, but even that is shared with our daughter. It's a dual desk and we both have computers on it and it's in the middle of the house. So I don't have many spaces that are just for me. So again, I'm not saying like create a room that's just yours and close it off and no one else is allowed in there. But is there a way you can be intentional with creating a little nook or a little area for yourself that during a certain time of day, it is just yours and it doesn't, you don't have to block it off and be like, this is mine and get out and leave me alone. And, you know, (laughs) girls rule, boys drool thing. This is not like a clubhouse. This is just a place for you to mentally just know like, okay, when I'm in this place, I can sit and relax And maybe this is your place that you go if you have extra declutter time, right? So if you say, I'm going to declutter, these are my 15 minutes a day that I'm decluttering. You get to a point where you've actually decluttered a lot in your home. You don't have anything else you need to declutter that day. You finished in five minutes. You can say, okay, for the next 10 minutes, I'm just going to go hang out in my little me nook and I'm just going to hang out and I can read, I can journal, I can sip some tea or coffee. I can listen to some music. I can listen to a podcast. I can do whatever I want. There's actually a book I'm reading right now. I will leave a link in the show notes. It's called Nixon, N-I-K-S-E-N. It's by Olga Mecking, and it's embracing the Dutch art of doing nothing. And it's talking about, you know, kind of in the U.S., I would have called it like vegging out, but it's a little bit more than that. It's a little bit more of this like refresh, relax, reset time of pretty much doing nothing, right? So you would look and you'd be like, what is it? Maybe they're just dazing off into space. No, you give it a a moment, you're nixing, right? You're having this purposeful time to rest and recharge and get back into it. We all need downtime. And so this might be a place where you can create this me area, this little nook for yourself, use some downtime, create specific downtime for yourself and just go here and hang out. And It's just a way for you to use decluttering purposefully to show yourself some self-love and compassion. All right, number six is to embrace minimalism. Now, simplifying our life and simplifying our possessions and adopting a minimalist mindset, I don't necessarily, I used to call this podcast wannabe minimalist because I don't think that I'm ever going to get to the point where I live out of a backpack, which is kind of crazy because we kind of did. <laughs> um, we traveled when our daughter was one. We actually just had carry. No, that's not the time we had carry-ons. Sorry. We actually did have a big suitcase then because she was one and we had a travel crib with us. So that fit in the suitcase. Um, when she was five, we did six months or five or six months um, in just carry-ons. And we traveled all over Europe and it was amazing. And I, we had a wonderful time and it was an amazing experience, but that wasn't sustainable. Like we always knew that wasn't long-term. We still had a storage unit back in Chicago. So I want to make sure that I always put that caveat on there of like, you still need stuff. Like it's okay to need things to live, 
even if you follow families on Instagram that have sold everything to travel the world, they're still staying in Airbnbs. There are still beds. There are still plates. There's still stuff to cook. There's still places to sit. There's still TVs to watch. There's still computers to use. Like, all of these things still exist. You still need a dining table. You need to be able to sit down and eat as a family, like whether that's out at a restaurant or at your own home. Like, again, no one's really living with just a backpack. Like, I'd like to set that expectation right up front, <laughs> but we can definitely live with a lot less. So one thing that living with less has helped us do, we've moved countless times. I mean, I think we've moved over 16 times in 20 years. It's so much easier to move when you don't have a ton of stuff. It's much easier to put it into boxes. It's much easier to unpack it. It's much easier to pack it up. Um, it has been really nice because we've been able to say yes to things like, hey, I got really burnt out and kindergarten's not required in the states we want to live in. So instead of going for a two-week vacation, which was then going to be a month vacation, which was then going to be the summer, turned into an indefinite time which ended up being about a year and a half for us in Europe when our daughter was five. Would not have been able to do that without the idea of stuff tying us down, right? We had the ability to move and be mobile and do different things and embrace different experiences because we didn't have a ton of stuff holding us back. Letting go of that excess stuff helps reduce your stress, helps create a more peaceful living environment, helps you be able to embrace adventure if that's what you're into, embrace relaxation if that's what you're into, just gives you a moment to breathe. Instead of feeling like you have to control everything, it is so freeing when you don't have so much stuff bogging you down. Now, again, you can see if you're watching this on video, I have things behind me. I have some plants. We have, this is actually from our trip in Rio. This is this picture behind me is the platform from where we went hang gliding in Rio de Janeiro. So, you know, I like to use the experiences we've had as different ways to decorate. We've got a wall over here with guitars. My husband plays guitar. So, you know, we use his guitars as decoration, like using things that are purposeful in our life. But again, we have stuff. This is a fold-out couch behind me because this is also our guest room. So being purposeful in what we have, like stuff is okay just as long as it's stuff you use and you like and you want it and it's purposeful for you. Instead of just holding on to stuff because it's always been there, open your mind. Be a little bit more of a minimalist if possible and say, how does this help me? Would I be okay if I didn't have it? Could I let it go? And be able to have that freedom in your life. It is life-changing. All right. Number seven is to involve your family. Get your family on board. I know a lot of this is about self-love and self-compassion, but I just finished recording an episode with Janet Taylor that will come out next week. And she and I actually had this really interesting moment talking about empathy and looking at decluttering from a different perspective of how can we respect our family with our belongings or our actions actually. And I really, it was, it was a great moment. And this is kind of similar in that. So involving our family and helping them, helping yourself by helping them and you vice versa, helping them by helping yourself and being able to, uh, you know, look at things like if I didn't have all this stuff around, could I spend more time with my family? So being able to declutter as a family is really kind of a fun activity. I know sometimes that sounds crazy. I did do an episode on how to make decluttering more fun with your family. I'll make sure I link to that in the show notes, but sometimes it's as simple as making it a little bit of a game. Who can find 10 things to declutter first? Um, how can we get these towels that we're decluttering into the donation bin? Can we play basketball with them? Can we throw things down from the top stairs if we have a staircase? Can we see how if this thing floats or does it, you know, how fast does it fall? Does it fall really fast? Does it kind of float to the ground? What are different ways we can just bring a slight aspect of fun and play into the moment and get our families on board? It doesn't all have to be drudgery and boring and, you know, things that we don't want to do and nobody wants to participate. It's not an all day affair. Remember we're doing 15 minutes. So again, if you're doing that with your kids, Hey, let's look through your treasure drawer. Let's go play with your treasures and see 
what's in there. And if you want to keep all these things, or maybe some are falling apart, who knows, but let's go see what's in there. And looking at it like a treasure hunt, being curious, being inquisitive, asking them questions, figuring out why things, why they kept the things they've kept and not from an in, like, don't interrogate, right? We're not looking at it from like a detective trying to get to the end of the bottom, you know, the mystery. But like you pull things out of their treasure drawer and you say, oh, look at this. Wow. What did you find so interesting about this? Or what do you find so interesting about this? Hmm. You know, and just asking open-ended questions and being really curious and listening to the answer. Let's like, that's really important. Make sure we listen to the answer and see what they're saying. Okay. Again, this can be more from a perspective of empathy and respect and talk about your own decluttering, right? Talk about your own decluttering journey with your family. So they understand if they're struggling to let go of something that they're not alone doing that. So maybe you say, Hey, I was going through this bin the other day and I found this one thing that I bought, I don't know, I bought it five years ago and I really liked it because of this. But you know what? I have realized I have not used it or played with it or worn it in five years. And I was thinking maybe someone else could use this. So I'm going to go ahead and get donate it, give it away, put it on the buy nothing group, see if our neighbor wants it, whatever you're going to do with your thing, right? So having that outward, that inner conversation that you've already had, you've already made this decision, but modeling that behavior for your family is really, really powerful because then they understand like, oh, mom had something that she found. She really liked it still, but she doesn't use it and she's going to go give it to somebody else. Now, it might take 10, 20, 30 times (laughs) of you doing that, right? Again, how many times did you have to remind your children to brush their teeth? probably countless times. For years, you had to do it twice a day for years, right? Again, decluttering, telling them one time is not going to make it stick, but just as you continue to do it and it becomes a habit for you and you keep telling them what you're decluttering and your process and all that kind of stuff, eventually it will click. Trust me, I've heard this countless, countless times from people that are like, yeah, 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 that's never going to work. And then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, you'll never believe what my daughter did, my son did, my husband did. You'll never believe it. I go, yeah, I do. Because you've been working the work, right? You've been doing it. You've been showing him and you've been modeling the behavior. And then they start to do it as well. So that's how you can involve your family. Make it fun. Make it a game if you can. Anytime you can just add a layer of fun and excitement to it will make a huge difference. And your approach to decluttering, right, your energy around it is infectious. So if it's good energy, they're going to be on board. If it is bad and drudgery, they aren't going to want to do it either. So try to be cognizant of that as you are working and decluttering around your family because it all comes back, right? We're doing this to make all of our lives better, not just your life, your family's life as well. And once you that starts to happen. It's just this lovely little cycle that continues to go around and around and around and everybody is much happier. Okay, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to dive into the last four tips of how you can bring in some self-love with your decluttering. Okay, welcome back. So the next thing is to practice self-compassion. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but I want us to make sure that we really hit this part home because I know that this is an area where I struggle. Like I am very, very hard on myself. I'm definitely a type A. I don't need anybody else to put pressure on me. I put enough pressure on myself. And so I need to remind myself to be self-compassionate, right? Have a moment of treating myself how I would treat any other human I come into contact with and make sure that I'm doing that for me too. Now, this might be building in breaks by taking a water break or just making sure that I take a moment and I set a timer and then after so long, I take that break. That's why I like to do the 15 minute increments because you can do a lot of, you can make a lot of progress, but it doesn't get too overwhelming. Also, make sure I have snacks set up. If I'm gonna be doing a lot of 15 minute declutter sessions in a row, 
I want to make sure that I'm fueled. I want to make sure that I got a good night's sleep. I want to make sure I'm not making decisions from a grumpy place. So maybe I'll do a nice little positive meditation before I, before I start. Maybe I'll make sure that I drink a full glass of water before I start. Maybe I'll have an extra coffee if I'm, you know, maybe I'll say like, okay, if after my first 15 minute declutter session, I'm going to reward myself with another cappuccino because that's one of my favorite things and it's easy to do. And I only try to let myself have one a day. And so if I have an extra one, that just feels a little extra, a little spicy, a little guilty, um, but it's not that bad for me. That is one way. Maybe I'll say, you know, when I declutter, I'm going to listen to this mystery book that I have really been wanting to listen to. It's a fiction book and I can get so wrapped up in those. So it's hard for me to resist like listening to those once I start one. And so maybe I'll say, okay, I'm going to declutter, but I want to listen to this book, but I only get to listen to this book when I'm decluttering. It's a fun way to get to listen to a fiction book, but also then make progress on an area in my life where I want to. And so those two meld together really well. Or maybe it's like going back to that moment of like giving gratitude and thanks. And this is kind of that other part of like making sure that I am patient with myself, make sure that I understand that some of these items are going to be sentimental. Maybe if it's, I'm not in a place for that today, being like, okay, this isn't something I can tackle today. I'm going to put it off to the side and I will come back to this because it's something I want to work on, but I'm just not there today. And again, letting that be okay for wherever you are, being kind to yourself, showing compassion, understanding that this is a process, and then making sure that you're being patient and gentle with yourself along the way. It is okay. It doesn't have to get done in one time. Maybe there's going to be another time where you're feeling really like just you feel centered and you're good and you're like, I can make these decisions today. That's when you can go back to those sentimental items. Okay? So just working with your own energy levels and how you're feeling that day and giving yourself self-compassion to then work through those bigger things. All right. The next one is digital decluttering. So how many times have you looked to declutter and you're just working on your physical space? I do it all the time. The digital stuff is so easy to forget until you really need it. So let's help ourselves, especially if you're on the computer all the time, like I am, you're recording videos, you're doing things that take a lot of space, make sure that you set up processes so that it makes it easier to deal with these things on a regular basis. And you don't get stuck where you're like, oh my gosh, I have to record an interview in 20 minutes and I'm out of space on my computer. I haven't done that course I have. Um, oops, that has happened to me. And I've scrambled to find an external hard drive or deleting a bunch of things before I needed to have that space free on my computer. And that is not a good feeling. So being able to work through some of this digital clutter before we get to that point is really great. And so this could be organizing your digital files, your emails, social media accounts, one of my favorite ways to show yourself self-love when you're decluttering your digital stuff is to unsubscribe from stuff you don't want. Maybe you're watching this on YouTube and you can unsubscribe from accounts that don't make you feel great, make you feel guilty, don't really inspire you to do anything. Go ahead and get that noise out. Maybe you have a bunch of catalogs coming to your home. I will leave a link to my favorite place where you can stop the catalogs if you can't get rid of them. Like if there's no place for you to call and get rid of that, if you want one place, it's catalogchoice.org. It's fantastic. I got rid of so many catalogs when I lived in my, our last place. The people before us were total shopaholics and we would get 20, 30 catalogs a month. It was ridiculous, but it was so nice to be able to get off of those lists because you know they then come to resident and so they never go away. But I finally got rid of them and it was really nice to just not have that noise come to our mailbox all the time. Maybe you're deleting old photos. One of my favorite things to do is to go back to whatever day we're on. So this is going to come out on February 28th. So let's go, you pull up your phone and you pull up your photos and you go type into the search February 28th and you can just go through the photos from that day. First off, it's really fun to get to reminisce and look back on the things you did on this specific date over the years. And two, it's an easy way for you to then have just a smaller subset of photos to then be able to declutter and delete the bad photos. You're not going to look at the bad photos. 
you will have the same memories flood back if you have one photo from the day that is amazing and you love and everybody looks great in it and you would put it on the wall as you would probably from that one good one and 10 bad photos, right? So you don't have to delete all of the photos, but understand, don't keep multiples of one photo. If people look bad and there's a different version of it, keep the best version, let go of the others. You're not going to miss them, I promise. Okay, so that is a way we can work through digital clutter and we can start to organize some of our spaces. Let's unsubscribe, let's delete things we don't need, and then organize your digital workspace for greater clarity and efficiency. Maybe that's um, creating some folders on your desktop. Maybe that's creating filters in your email. Maybe that is just a way to kind of tone down the noise, turn off your notifications on your phone and on your computer, try to quiet things down, and that really will help give you a little bit more mental space to deal with these things as they come in. And that is a really great way to show yourself some love on a regular basis. The next one is to set boundaries. I talked about this with um, my guest last week with Tony and Mayambe, and she talked about saying no. This one is such a big challenge for me. I really struggle with saying no, but we can do it. And as with anything else, practice makes it much easier, right? So say no to some little things that you know, you don't feel too bad about. It's a little bit easier for you. It's okay. Maybe even just doing all that digital decluttering is really going to help you because sometimes you feel guilty for unsubscribing from things, right? Look at that as a way to say no. No, thank you. I don't need this anymore in my life. No, thank you. I'm going to take back some time. No, thank you. I'm going to free up some space. It's a little bit easier a way to say no. You don't have to say no right to somebody's face, but Also, if no is hard for you, think about some other ways you can say no. Maybe you say, oh, that sounds interesting, but I need to check my calendar to make sure that I have the time. Then if you get home and you're like, okay, I totally want to do that. There's space in my calendar. You get the chance to say, yes, heck yes, I would really love to do that. If you get home or even as you're leaving, you're like, oh, I really don't want to do that. Then you have a moment. You're no longer right in front of their face. You just say, Sorry, it just doesn't work for me right now. Thank you. Done. That's it. You didn't have to say no to their face, but you still got to say no. You set up a boundary for yourself and then you understood where that was. One of the best ways to show love to yourself is to put yourself first, but not in a way that is selfish, in a way that works for you and your family, right? You're saying no to something because you want to do something else. Every yes to something is a no to something else. So if you say yes to somebody who's asking for your time, well, that means less time that you are going to have after school with your kids or less time you're going to have to declutter or less time you're going to be able to go on a date with your husband or whatever it is, right? You're taking time out of your life to say yes to something, to commit to something, using resources, whether it's your time, your energy, your money, whatever. Anytime you say yes, it is no to something else. So just make sure you're saying yes to the things that really matter to you. Don't be a jerk about it when you say no, but be able to say no to things. So maybe that is declining an invitation to something. Maybe it's setting limits on the number of toys that your kids receive. Maybe it's setting limits on the number of toys you buy. Maybe you're setting up a limit When you go to your next target run, if you're used to your kids being able, if they always are asking for something and you give in and you buy them something every time you go to target, maybe it is, hey, I'm going to give you $1 every time we go to target and you decide how you want to spend that. If you want to buy something for a dollar in the bullseye section, okay. But if you want to buy something bigger, well, let's save it up and then you can buy that bigger thing the next time we go. Again, Baby steps incrementally working you toward the goals you actually have for your life are really important. Okay, the last one for the day is to celebrate your progress. So this is kind of our bonus one, actually, since I added that extra one in there. So this is number 11. I want you to celebrate your progress, no matter how small. Please, 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 no matter how small. I want you to take time to acknowledge the positive changes that you are making in your home and in your life. I want you to understand that every positive change you make is totally worth celebrating. Totally, totally, totally worth celebrating. Because 
that means you have grown. You are doing something different. I was thinking about this the other day about something being hard or easy. And I just thought, well, the reason things are hard is because you don't do them regularly. If it was easy, then you wouldn't even realize it. I was thinking, well, so in the at the moment, I'm working on kind of getting in better shape. I feel like I'm in fine shape, but I really want to be in like really good shape. And so it's hard, right? It is hard to not eat what I want to eat when I want to eat. It's hard to work out every day when I'd rather just sit on the couch. But sitting on the couch is not going to get me to the result of being in the best shape that I want to be in, right? Eating the cake or bread or whatever is not going to get me into the shape I want to be in. It's not going to help me. It's not going to give me the energy. Just like I love how my house feels after I declutter it. I love the space it gives me. I love the mental clarity. I love all of that. So it's like I get that sometimes we have to do hard things in order to get the results we want. And if it were easy, you would already be doing it and this wouldn't even be a goal for you right? Your goals are not based on the things that are easy for you. Your goals are based on the things that you, where you want to be and what you want to do. And generally it's kind of difficult to get there. That's why we're not there yet, but we can get there. So I want you to celebrate, please celebrate any progress you make, no matter how small, because it is a step in the direction. It is a vote for the person you want to be. You are getting to that point where you will then Look back and be like, oh my gosh, look how far I have come. That is amazing. You deserve the life that you want to be living. Just understand that it is a series of steps. It is a series of progress. It's not going to happen overnight. Didn't You didn't get to where you are overnight, so we're not going to get to where we want to be overnight, but you will get there if you work on giving yourself that self-compassion, giving yourself that self-love, and really understanding that it's not selfish to do this. So I want you to remember, as busy moms, it is essential for us to practice self-love. We are setting the bar for our families. We are modeling the behavior we want them to have, like we want them to see and to do. It is not selfish. It is you modeling the behavior that you want to see in your family as well. We want everyone to be self-reliant, self-efficient, have their self-worth and boost their self-confidence. And that happens when they see it in you as well. So it is necessary for your health and your happiness. It is not coming from a place of anger or one-upping other people. It is creating your life to be the best it can be so that you can shine out into the world. By incorporating these 11 tips into your decluttering journey, you're not only creating a more organized home, but you're also showing yourself and your family the love that you deserve. And so with that, I would love to turn to you and ask you, which was your favorite tip from today? Come on over to the Wannabe Minimalist Family Group on Facebook and share. We have a community over there and we talk about the different episodes and get feedback and just share with each other. It's a really fun community over there. And I'm also on Instagram. So if you prefer to come talk to me over there, we can chat there as well. I am at Wannabe Clutter Free on the social channels. There will be a post. Go ahead and comment or send me a DM or share this in your stories. I would absolutely love to see it and make sure you tag me. So as always, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here and listen. And I hope I was able to inspire you to work on decluttering as a form of self-love so that you can create the space and the life that you want. If you made it this far, I would love for you to give this show a review on whatever podcast app you are listening to this on or join us over on YouTube and comment and share there as well. Or go ahead and share this episode with a friend. It might be what they need to hear today. And you can then get an accountability buddy and work on this stuff together. It really does help when you have a partner in this and on this journey with you. With that, I hope you have an amazing day. And I will see you back here next week for a guest episode. I already alluded to this, but I am chatting with Janet M. Taylor. She's a professional organizer and we talk about organizing and decluttering and how to really work it into your home without getting overwhelmed or if you're already overwhelmed, where do you start? She is just a wealth of knowledge and I really enjoyed my conversation with her. So make sure you check that out next week. Until next time, keep decluttering, 
work on these little incremental steps and show yourself some self-love and compassion along the way. I'm Deanna Gates, and you've been listening to Wanna Be Clutter Free. I'll see you next week. Cheers.